do we introduce the Reformations? Well, I think the place to start is by saying we are talking about Reformations plural. There was a time when Luther's story so dominated, it was almost as if that was the only reform going on at the time. These days, I think we would tell the story very differently and we would want to emphasise that actually there were several reformations and part of the way in which we need to understand the story is to ask the question, why did Luther's story become so dominant? So because I want to emphasise that there were lots of different reformations happening, I'm actually going to start with a church council, which probably doesn't sound particularly exciting. But I need to tell you that this particular church council, the Fifth Lateran Council, finished in May of 1517. And that means it's important for our story because Luther will burst into prominence with the 95 Theses, um, in, no in October or November of the same year. So I'm quite interested in the Fifth Lateran Council precisely because it gives us a little bit of insight into how the leaders of the church, the Pope and the Cardinals, saw the Catholic Church immediately before Luther sprang to fame. And the fascinating thing about the Fifth Lateran Council is that it is a council in which everybody was absolutely insistent that the church needed to be reformed. We have all of its decrees. We also have most of the speeches which were given at the beginning of every session. And pretty well every speaker insists the church needs to be reformed. That may sound great, but the issue is that they were very short on detail. So they will make great sweeping statements about corruption and various other problems, but they don't give us anything very specific. And even worse than that, they certainly don't seem to have agreed very often on exactly what, therefore, the church should do. And it's worth knowing that about the early 16th century. It's not just the Pope and the Cardinals. It was generally agreed that the church was in need of reform. In fact, Oberman has argued that reform of the church in the 16th century was a little bit like democracy today. Everybody thought it was a good idea. The issue is getting some kind of agreement about what it would actually look like. And it is also worth addressing um, another old illusion of the way that we tell the story of the Reformations. Just because there were plenty of people agreeing that the church desperately needed reform didn't mean that somehow they were giving up on their faith. If anything, it was the other way round. We have quite a lot of evidence of a deepening spirituality, of a faith which was becoming more important to people. And it's precisely because of that that the complaints about the church get louder. It's almost as if um, people are taking their faith more seriously, so they've got a deeper sense of what the church should be. So let's go back to the Fifth Lateran Council. It met over 12 sessions and a surprisingly large number of those sessions were devoted to explaining why a previous council, which had met at uh, Pisa, um, was not really a council at all. It was a quasi-council and it had been generally a bad idea. And I'm going to come back to why they spent so much time explaining that Pisa was wrong. But we can get some flavour of what reform might have looked like by if we just look at few, a few of the proposals for reform that the Cardinals and the Pope did manage to agree on. So uh, one of the first proposals for reform that they actually managed to pass banned simony in papal elections. Simony is basically the, the sin of taking a bribe um, or offering a bribe in order to gain any kind of office in the church. So the very fact that they were concerned about bribery in the election of a pope tells you that things were not going very well. And I might add that there is a certain irony to this. In this particular session, the pope 
um, was Julius II, and one of the accusations which had been laid against Julius II was precisely that he had bribed his way into the papacy. And what then happened, in fact, was that Julius II died and was replaced by Leo X before the council reformed yet again. And, and then they did pass some more um, uh, decrees uh, of, about, around the idea of reform. So, for example, they addressed what universities should be teaching. And I'm picking that little detail out because I am going to remind you that Martin Luther was a university professor. So we can see some unease in the church before Luther has said anything controversial that the universities are not teaching Christian truth. Um, in fact, there's even one lovely little detail where they say anybody who is in orders can only study philosophy or poetry for five years and after that they have to get back to theology. And, of course, the theology that they meant was um, theology in accord with the teaching of the Catholic Church. They also addressed the issue of preaching. And again, this is a very important background for the Protestant Reformations, um, because you will remember that Luther was eventually provoked to anger by an indulgence seller, somebody who was literally implying in the name of the church, if you buy this piece of paper, then either you or one of your relatives can have time off the time that they will spend in purgatory. Purgatory was believed to be a place of suffering that you went to after death, which prepared you for heaven. And the problem with the indulgent sellers was that what they said was a long way from official Catholic teaching. And again, at the Fifth Lateran Council, we can see that the Pope and the Cardinals were concerned that not only in the indulgent sellers, although they would be a good example, but a lot of preachers were going around basically being entertaining or preaching pretty well whatever they wanted. And so one of the decrees of the Fifth Lateran Council urges that all preachers should preach only Christian truth. So let's go back to why the Fifth Lateran Council would want to spend so long explaining why the council at Pisa was a quasi-council and not a real one at all. And to understand that, you do need to understand something about Julius II, the, the Pope who actually called the Fifth Lateran Council. There was a general perception that Julius II was not exactly what you would call a pious Pope. In fact, he was perceived as being quite warlike. Um, he literally led his troops into battle. And in fact, after his death, there was a bestseller the central joke of which was that Julius couldn't get himself into heaven. It's called Julius Excluded from Heaven, and it tells the story of Julius turning up and meeting St. Peter at the door, having discovered that what he thought to, was the key to heaven didn't work. He then has to try to talk his way past St. Peter, who denies all knowledge of him, and in the process, Julius basically manages to demonstrate that the papacy for him is all about war and gain and money and he has very little to say about anything spiritual. There is of course a big argument about just how fair that was to Julius II but the very fact that that um, became a bestseller tells you something about the perception of him um, at the time. So Pisa was threatening because it was a group of cardinals, mainly French cardinals, um, at the encouragement of the King of France and with the connivance of the Holy Roman Emperor, who got together without Julius. They called their own council. And what's more, it certainly looks as though one of their main aims may have been to depose Julius entirely. And you can understand that Julius would find that quite threatening. 
And it's worth knowing that even before PISA, there's an even longer back history of a huge disagreement within the Catholic tradition about the relative power of a church council as against the power of the Pope. So it certainly looks to us as though Julius found Pisa very threatening. Whether it's actually possible they could ever have deposed him, we don't know. But we do know that Julius took the threat seriously enough to call the Fifth Lateran Council and to ensure that the Fifth Lateran Council didn't just produce a general statement that Pisa had been wrong. Oh no, they spent five sessions going through everything that had been said, carefully explaining just how bad it was. Let me read you one quotation. We condemn, reject and detest each and everything done by those sons of damnation. They then name the cardinals. The cardinals, by the way, are then described as formally cardinals. And the condemnation goes on to include their supporters, adherents, accomplices and disciples who are schismatics and heretics and have worked madly to their own and others' ruin aiming to split asunder the unity of the Holy Mother Church at the Quasi Council. And believe me, that was only the beginning. And in fact, it wasn't until Julius II died that eventually there was an agreement between the French king and uh, Leo X, which enabled those poor cardinals to get their positions back. And why does all that matter? Well, you will sometimes read historians arguing that by um, the early 16th century, conciliarism never raised its head again. And, and in one sense, that's true. From this point onwards, it is quite clear um, that uh, papal authority over church councils becomes established in the Catholic tradition. But my point is that that's not how it looked in May 1517. If it had, then first Julius and then Leo would not have spent quite so long explaining why Pisa was quite so bad. And that all is going to matter because Martin Luther, almost from the beginning, raises the issue of the Pope's authority. And as the argument gets worse and worse, then Luther, guess what, appeals to a church council over the head of the Pope. I can't think why that didn't go down very well. So, we've reached somewhere around 1517, and this is where I just want to pause for a moment and say, where are our two major Protestant reformers? And I really do want to stress the two major Protestant reformers, because I want to tell you the story not only of Martin Luther, but also of Huldrych Zwingli. And I'm going to start with Zwingli because I think his story starts slightly earlier, and also because he is so often the story that gets missed out. So what do we know about Zwingli at this point? Well, we know that he was a very popular preacher. In fact, um, around May 1517, he is still in the Swiss town of Eiseldon, uh, where he is the town preacher, and he has for some time been insisting that he will preach from Scripture alone. He's already gone through what we might call a conversion experience, where reading a poem by Erasmus convinced him to put his faith in Christ alone, and he's occupied in study and also in preaching. And just to leap ahead a little bit, while I tell you the story of Zwingli, one of the last things that happened to him when he was in Einzelden was that an indulgence seller came to town. Uh, the man's name was Bernard Samson. He preached indulgences. Swingley took great offence. So Swingley got up into his pulpit and he explained to the congregation exactly why Samson was wrong and he won the argument. And his bishop backed him up. And Swingley was later to boast that he preached that man out of town. That happened in, uh, in early 1518, so slightly after the argument with Luther had begun, 
But it's a very important detail because it shows us that the Catholic Church was a very broad church and that the argument with Luther was never just about indulgences. There were a lot of people who thought there were problems with indulgences. So what about Luther in May 1517? Well, I would say that Luther was holding down his day job, but the reality was, as far as I, could work out, I can work out, he was holding down something like four day jobs. He was an Augustinian friar, and it's important that we use the word friar rather than monk, because in English, at least, a monk is one who lives within the monastery. A friar is part of a preaching order, someone whose main role in life is to preach the gospel and who might not even actually have a friary, although Luther did. Uh, except that Luther is not just an Augustinian friar. He is, in fact, involved in training friars. He is a professor, uh, particularly of biblical studies, although he taught more broadly. He's a professor at the relatively new University of Wittenberg. So that's two fairly major jobs, but Luther um, obviously did not like getting bored because he was also the town preacher for Wittenberg. That's where he is most similar to Swingley. It's worth knowing that in many parts of the Holy Roman Empire, then towns could choose their own preachers and appoint their own preachers. Um, and so to be the town preacher was quite an honour. In addition to that, so he's teaching at a university, he is preaching very regularly to the town in the town of Wittenberg, and he's also been elected to um, a basic overseer position, which means it's also his job to do visitations for a number of other friaries. So we have a, a wonderful letter from him dated just before the argument blows up where he talks about how busy he is and how much he has to do and he includes in his many lists of duties sorting out a fish pond at one of the friaries and uh, an argument that's going on at another one. Martin Luther was later to describe himself as a failure as a monk and people have often taken that very, very literally. It's important to realise that he was discussing his spiritual problems. If you had met him outwardly, he was very busy and very successful and highly popular. And in 1517, nobody saw any trouble coming at all. But let me tell you something about universities in the early 16th century. Um, and that is that one of the ways that um, they were convinced were the was the right way to get at the truth, to explore a subject, um, was to hold what they called a disputation. And the way in which a disputation was set up was really quite formal and very well understood. And the process went like this. First, um, someone, probably one of the professors, would write a series of theses. And then somebody would be chosen to, um, to defend those theses. Someone else would be chosen to attack those theses. And then there would be a public disputation in which that discussion took place. And the person who wrote the theses would then sum up the discussion at the end. So writing theses was an absolutely standard part of any university professor's life. And it's very important to realise that they were written to provoke debate. So if you had an issue that you weren't sure about, you would write a number of theses and invite people to come and to discuss those with you precisely as a means of exploring what is truth. Um, Wittenberg University has been described as a thesis factory at the time. Uh, Luther was by no means unusual in writing a number of them, and actually 95 was really quite restrained. So when we think about October 1517 and the writing of the 95 theses, one of the major things to emphasise is how boringly ordinary it was. That was Luther's job. So how then did it all go so badly wrong? Well, that's a slightly more complicated story 
And it all has to do with who Luther then sent the theses to. What's slightly unusual, although it does happen in other instances, but what is slightly unusual is that Luther wrote and published them without having agreed who would uh, defend them and who would attack them. And he then sent them to a number of his more academic friends, presumably in an attempt to get the disputation going. Um, but in addition to that, somewhat fatefully, he also sent them to his local bishop. So let's just start with when he sent them to his friends. What Luther did not anticipate is that it was in fact his friends who said, oh, these are quite interesting, aren't they? Should we get them printed so that more people can see them? And so Luther actually lost control of the 95 Theses remarkably quickly. And we even have letters from Luther in which he says, well, I, I didn't actually quite intend that they would go out for publication. If I'd known that somebody was going to print them, I, I might have said a few things a little differently. But printed they were, and they caused a very small, minor sensation among some of Luther's academic friends. But that wasn't the real problem. The real problem came um, when Luther also decided that because there was a specific indulgent seller who was selling in the name of his local bishop, he needed to write to several, in fact, of his local bishops and protest what was going on. One of those bishops was Albrecht or Albert of Mainz. And to understand exactly why Luther got into quite so much trouble, you do need a little bit of backstory on Albrecht. Albrecht was the younger brother of Joachim, who was the elector of Brandenburg. So he came from a very wealthy, powerful family. And in what feels like a slightly traditional arrangement, um, the older brother got the title and the younger brother was sent into the church. Um, and Albrecht, with a powerful family behind him, rose through the ranks remarkably quickly. So he became an Archbishop of Magdeburg um, at a very young age. And very unfortunately for Albrecht, the much more interesting and exciting, wealthy and powerful Archbishopric of Mainz came up just a year later. You have to understand that church law um, strictly forbids anyone from holding two archbishoprics at the same time. Um, this was in 1514, so by now the Fifth Lateran Council, remember, is sorting out all those great reform problems in the church. So uh, what did Albrecht do about the fact that he was already archbishop and he wanted to be archbishop of Mainz as well? Well, obviously he just went ahead and uh, a fine was imposed and let's say I think money may have changed hands. And then Albrecht was in a real problem because he was actually quite broke. He took out loans in order to pay for all of this and also to pay for the fact he was a great collector of the arts. So by 1517, he is struggling with his debts. How is he going to pay them? Well, Leo X, who, remember, has just closed the Great Reforming Council, which is going to sort out all of those problems in the church, happily agrees with Albrecht that they will um, authorise an indulgent seller and split the profits. 50% will go to pay Albrecht's debts and 50% will go to pay for the new chapel at the Vatican. And so Albrecht um, was perfectly well aware that Tetzel was preaching um, as an indulgent seller and I rather suspect was perfectly well aware of the kind of promises that Tetzel was making which Luther objected to. So Luther wrote to Albrecht of Mainz. He, he does try that nice little trick of, are you aware, O oh Archbishop, that this is being done in your name, but surely without your knowledge and consent? But he basically wrote a fairly long letter complaining at uh, what Tetzel had been doing. He signed it, he dated it, 31st of October, 1517, and then 
he wrote a little PS. Almost as an afterthought, he adds, by the way, I've written these theses. You might like to read them. They will explain some of my theological objections. Personally, I've always quite liked the idea that the Lutheran Reformation was started by a PS. 